The last part of our search for the cutthroat trout took us to the bottom of Yellowstone Lake. Now we follow the trout on a danger-filled journey to their spawning areas as they run the raging rapids of Yellowstone River. The river cuts through Wyoming's Yellowstone Park, flowing north out of the lake. Seven miles above our base at Bridge Bay Marina lies our destination, Lahardy Rapids. Hundreds of huge river cutthroat congregate below the rapids for the first major hurdle of their journey. Both sexes show brighter colors now, with the males tending more toward red and gold than the females. They group tightly together before their upstream assault on the rapids. I move in for a closer look. Whoa! Great! Like their larger cousins, the salmon, cutthroat must battle the wild river. Water velocity at Lahardy Rapids averages five feet per second. This section of the raging Yellowstone is a mighty challenge for a little fish. Wow! I feel like an early explorer. They told of being able to reach right in and come out with a handful of trout but the same slime-secreting glands that seal the fish's scales from bacteria also keep it from being caught too easily.
are a beauty. What's it like being a fish, anyway? Guess I'll never know. Slippery, oh. too. Come on. This area is one of several on the continent where magma, or molten rock below the Earth's crust, is closest to the surface. Perhaps as a result of this, the land around Lahardi Rapids is continually rising. It goes up about one inch per year. Someday, the trout may need to find different areas to breed if their spawning gravel ever become covered by the shifting water levels and silt. While I was exploring the river, crew member David Huey was scouting downstream. I spot him from a distance across the meadow. In an attempt to get back to where we're filming, David takes a shortcut. He's been around animals long enough to know better. If you think that a grizzly bear can be mean, you've never come across a mother elk defending her calf. David barely pulls off a bluff. Whoa. Whoa. As fair warning for all of you who think that these docile looking elk are friendly and approachable, they're not. The cow sounds a warning to the other elk and to David by grinding her teeth. Hey, whoa. Don't ever approach wild animals this way, especially a mother and her baby. It's a mistake many people make in Yellowstone. When I asked David later why he did it, he said that it seemed like a good idea at the time. I recommend that we all learn a lesson from him, because in the end, his shortcut was more dangerous than time-saving. rapids, this river, they never rest. Neither do the cutthroat trout, now that nature calls them to multiply their numbers. All along the shore, row on row, they line up. Then, according to some sort of fish pecking order, each takes its turn running the rapids. With this much to see from top water, I can't wait to get a look at what's going on below.
the trout make it look so easy, but for me, one wrong step and I'll be swept downstream. Fortunately, I find safe footing and a trout's eye view of the action. Some people think a fish is stupid, anything but. Life in the wild has taught them what to approach and what to avoid. Our on-the-spot observation is that they're not frightened when human divers are underwater, but when the divers stand up, the fish swim away. The black lava rock covering the riverbed is evidence of the lake's volcanic beginning some 600,000 years ago. And the fish also seem ancient as they dance to an age-old rhythm of procreation and survival. I'm in an eddy behind a large boulder. As I face upstream, I see the trout heading toward me. Because the water swirls in the eddy, the fish are actually swimming into the current, but pointing downstream. Even though the cutthroat are not shy, they're not overly friendly either. I look for other life forms and uncover some stonefly nymphs, an important food source for the trout. These nymphs are an immature stage of an insect that's known by two names. Stonefly, because it spends most of its brief two to three week adult life under rocks, and salmonfly, because it tends toward that color. The cutthroat don't care what they're called. By any name, they'll taste just as good. feeding gains me some friends. As I hold out the nymphs, the fish are immediately interested. An absence of salmon flies points to pollution. Both insect and fish require oxygen-rich waters. A 
I'm amazed, even in this already magical underwater world, that I can hand feed a wild fish. Even more amazing is the next discovery about how the fish eat. They chew the nymphs. I never had any idea that fish chewed their food, and I certainly never read about it anywhere. I thought they just gulped it down. For now, it's back to the real world to refill the tank and reload the camera. Still, the sight of the cutthroat stays with me. They're truly fascinating, much more so than I ever imagined. The next morning, my wife Diane yeah, and daughter Hannah watched the greatest fish show in North America, the spawning cutthroat that gather under Fishing Bridge. Look, Mom, there's two big fish. Fish watching is now a proud tradition in the park. In fact, today more people watch than catch fish but fish catching was once the main activity here. The bridge was closed to fishing in 1973 after years of overfishing caused the collapse of the cutthroat population in the 60s. At the beginning of the century, trout of enormous size were common and there was no limit to the number that could be caught. Marshall comes upstream to scout more filming locations. Hey, Marshall, don't forget these. Yeah, I forgot these, thanks. Have you seen those guys? They're still at Lahardy. Yeah, well, thanks for these. Although prohibited from the bridge, fishing is allowed in nearby waters and provides what many consider the best trout experience in America. In many waters, Fish of any size can be kept, but from the lake and its tributaries, only trout under 13 inches are allowed. This leaves the larger, older fish to produce more offspring. Many streams and rivers are catch and release. Some areas are closed entirely. It's wise wildlife management and the Park Service is to be commended for setting aside this rich source of food for the original inhabitants. The cutthroat is vital to the survival of this otter family. To the osprey that fishes in the river, then returns to its nest in the canyon. and to the grizzly that follows the streams to make a meal of trout, 
alive or dead. This relatively young bear is about three to four years old. Although the percentage of trout in its diet is small, it's essential protein. The spawning trout also require protein. For that, they depend on the superbly timed abundance of insects that hatch in and along the river. These moth-like creatures are adult caddis flies. They swarm by the millions. Summer, though brief, brings a brilliant flowering of life from the air above to the water below where the caddis worm lives. Many carry their homes around with them. The constructions are characteristic to each species. This bristly version traps food particles and may discourage predators. This nearly transparent creature with flapping leaf-like gills along its abdomen is the nymph of a mayfly, another insect that is vital trout food in both its adult and immature forms. It may remain in the larval stage for as little as 16 days or as long as two years. The adult lives little more than a few hours, a few weeks at the most. The males swarm together in dense clouds. As they move up and down in unison, they look like wisps of smoke coming off the treetops. Several fishermen's artificial flies are modeled after this, the adult mayfly. Remember the salmon flies? The large insect larva that I fed the trout underwater? They crawled ashore to molt out of their shell into these mature adults. The newly emerged adults stay hidden near the shore where their metamorphosis took place for most of their short two to three week lives. Most cannot feed at all. They can mate and do so day and night, frantically writhing in an insect orgy. The males even try to mate with females of other species, but with little success because their copulatory organs are only compatible with female salmon flies. They're like lock and key. As the salmon flies search for mates, they provide a wealth of food for several animals, such as this leopard frog. In the air, too, they're a feast for seagulls. The female, a ball of fertilized eggs stuck to her abdomen, 
finally leaves the land and returns to the river to deposit her egg-laden ball. Future generations insured, the salmon flies make a further contribution to the ecosystem by becoming food for the cutthroat. Relics of an ancient past, salmon flies, or stone flies, colonized the continent during the Ice Ages. The emergence of these various aquatic insects is a critical part of the underwater food web in Yellowstone's rivers and lakes. But we must leave these miracles for now. In the next part of our story, we'll be moving with the fish again as they head up the spawning streams to continue their cycle. It's there we'll discover the amazing conclusion of the cutthroat story. I'm Marty Stauffer. Until next time, enjoy our wild America.